welcome to this virtual Commonwealth Club program. I am Marisa Lagos, politics correspondent at KQED Public Media in San Francisco and co-host of the Political Breakdown podcast. In the Bay Area, the Commonwealth Club has suspended its programming in person through April, but we're introducing a special new virtual programming. You can learn about these offerings at the club's website, commonwealthclub.org, which is being updated regularly with new programs that you can watch remotely while sheltering in place. Uh, this program is part of the Commonwealth Club's virtual series, addressing the impacts of COVID-19 on our community and society at large. Today's conversation is also part of the club's Future of Democracy series, supported by a gift from Roy and Betsy Eisenhart, with additional support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and a collaborative of local funders and donors. We're so grateful for their support and hope others will follow their example to support the club in these uncertain times. I am personally thrilled to be talking with two experts on a lot of things, uh, including we hope the effects of COVID-19, uh, it, what it's having, the effects it's having and may continue to have on democracy, both here in the U.S. and around the world. James Fallows is a national correspondent for The Atlantic and has written for the magazine since the late 1970s. His writing takes a human approach to some of the most pressing issues facing the world, and he and his wife, Deb, are the authors of the recent bestseller, Our Towns, A 100,000 Mile Journey into the Heart of America. James, thank you so much for being here. Marisa, thank you. Corey Shockey is the Director of Foreign and Defense Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C. She's had an impressive career in the field of defense policy, which has taken her to the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London, the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, where I remember her from in the Bay Area, and the U.S. State Department, the U.S. Department of Defense, and the National Security Council. Corey, thank you so much for your time. It's a great pleasure, Marisa. So, Thanks to you both for being here and also to our audience for joining us. Um, we do want to answer your questions as part of this conversation. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can submit them in the text chat. And if you're watching on Facebook, you can write them in the comments. Um, I'll be given those questions as this conversation progresses and try to work some of them into this conversation. So I thought we'd kind of start big picture, global picture, um, and then come down to uh, Earth and, and the States uh, in a little bit later. Um, but to get started, and Corey, let's start with you. Can you give us a sense of how you think broadly democracy around the globe is doing today in this crisis? Well, um, democracies generally are slow to organize, slow to decisive action, but they are also, the political science research on this is quite strong, that democracies are also more enduring in their commitments because they have public buy-in and legitimacy in a way that authoritarian governments don't have. And I think you begin to see that play out if you look at the repressiveness with which the government of China had to enforce uh, lockdowns when the crisis was raging there and the unwillingness of the Chinese government to share information about their experience in a way that would have helped other countries better prepare for when the virus spread. Compare that to Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan, where you have broad public voluntary um, compliance with what the government wants to do, and over longer periods of time, that's likely to be sustained. So it's not um, government type isn't the only thing going on here. The quality of governance that we see in some societies compared to others for example, the catastrophic failure of the American government uh, at the federal level to organize, prepare, and bring federal authorities and federal resources to bear. That's a failure of governance. It's not a failure of government type. Other democracies, Germany, New Zealand, Finland, uh, are doing great at it. So governance type isn't everything, but it sure does matter. Yeah. I mean, what about you, James? Do you feel like this is challenging democratic systems in any way? Or, or do you agree with Corey that really we are better prepared in many ways because of that buy-in and that trust that you may not have in a place like China or, you know, Iran? I guess one of the lessons of my very long life uh, as a reporter is that 
contradictory things are all simultaneously true. And I think both parts <laughs> of your of your question are true. And I agree with what Corey was saying. And also to say just one bit of stage business here, it's worth, since we're talking about democracy and its future in times of stress, to recognize the importance of the Commonwealth Club and what it stands for and what it does, of KQED and what you do there, of Corey herself and what she's doing at AEI. And to say a word about that, that Corey and I come from different political traditions. She a more conservative branch, I a more liberal one. But the the way in which she personally and her, and her colleagues at AI in particular are trying to hold today's governance to classic conservative standards is really important. And I think that I just wanted to make sure that that, that we we note that. And it's why I'm glad to be with her Thank now. Thank you, James. Uh, yeah. and, you know, my I, I actually uh, mean it about all the institutions involved here. On Not to mention the Atlantic, of course. <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah, so and, and Corey and I have that, that in, in common too. Uh, the Let me just talk about two countries in particular, one briefly about China and then one about the U.S., and both just um, sort of complement in a complementary sense, complementary both with the I and the E to what uh, Corey was saying. In China, it's impressive both how this shows the fragility of the system and some of its strengths. It is possible that by brute force, China has actually controlled the level of infection at something like what they're currently claiming. Although the idea that it stopped in the so 3,000 or so uh, deaths is hard to, uh, it's hard to imagine that will stand up. The reports I get from friends in China is there is some sense of national solidarity and pride that has, that has come through the way in which they were ravaged by this early this year and have, have gotten it somewhat under control, but at a terrible price, as Corey was saying, both domestically and I think internationally. And, and so th there are contradictions within China. What has struck me in the U.S., again, as Corey was saying, is the, uh, the national government has failed about as dramatically as it possibly could. And one of the main themes that my wife Deb and I have been making in the last years of reporting for The Atlantic in our book and some sessions we did at the Commonwealth Club in particular is that at this moment of chronic weakness and failure and paralysis of the national government, we have city governments and mayors and regional coalitions and state governors and, and civic organizations still being vital, still being healthy, still representing the America we would like to think exists. And this is not a silver lining moment for the U.S. because it's a terrible public health and economic catastrophe we're living through. But the ways that governors, regardless of party, mayors, regardless of party, religious organizations, most of them, regional compacts have emerged to reflect the way we would like the U.S. to respond. Uh, that has been striking and is something I, I hope we can build with for our build on for our democratic future. Yeah, I want to come back to that, James, because I know that's something you had been thinking about prior to this crisis, you know, breaking out. And I think it, it does speak um, to also the sort of immediacy of government. Like we know and trust the people closest to us often. Um, you see this, you know, I think in a lot of ways here. I want to stick, though, with the international theme for a moment and, and ask about something else, which is a balance between civil liberties and an effective response to this. Um, maybe taking China or Iran or those types of authoritarian governments out of here, but thinking about South Korea or Singapore. I mean, they have much more aggressive sort of tactics in terms of tracking people, in terms of, um, you know, ensuring that their citizens are, are doing what they need to. And, and we're obviously far behind on a lot of areas, but I wanted to get both your thoughts. James, we'll stick with you first about like how you're thinking about that. And if you think we're striking the right balance here in the United States. I think nobody looking back from the future towards this moment in American history is going to be satisfies or pleased or complimentary with an eye about many things the U.S. is doing to strike a balance now. I think we are feeling our way towards that again, city by city, state by state, significantly region by region. I think that is the most heartening news development of the last while, the way both on the West Coast and in New England, and I think now in the Great Lakes, there are these regional compacts coming together. I think that the, there will be some feeling our way towards the balance. It's important in thinking about Singapore. I, I lived on the Malay Peninsula for several years in Kuala Lumpur a while ago to recognize the questions both of scale there. It is a city state. You know, it's essentially um, like part of Los Angeles or part of uh, the city of San Francisco with a long sort of effective authoritarian tradition. 
you know, they sort of recognize Lee Kuan Yew used to boast about he how he showed authoritarianism that worked and was uh, protective of some civil liberties, but not not all. Uh, South Korea is a more sort of free swinging place than Singapore is, but but they still have authoritarianism in their more recent past than the U.S. has. And it's also a more concentrated uh, geographic area that, than the U.S. is. I, I think that that we can admire the tactics they have used. And I'm sure that um, it, I think any of us, if we were having discussion three or four months ago, we would have been astonished to think that the mayors of San Francisco and Chicago and Los Angeles and and, and then belatedly New York we're imposing what we think of as as quite strict requirements on the public out of out of keeping with the liberal image right. of, of those cities. So, I think w one of the the tasks over the next month or two or year or two is evolving towards the acceptable balance among the economic damage that is profound, the privacy interests that we all have. And the the, uh, the the public health interests we also have. I've been reading once again the plague by Albert Camus, which is <laughs> is I, I guess I would distribute that along with a test kits around the country. <laughs> it, it is you know the, the, these these are long term questions the public has dealt with, and we're we're feeling our way towards. I mean, Corey, what do you think about that? Like, is this a moment where it's worth giving up some of our civil liberties to ensure? the ability for an economic and public health recovery, which are really sort of hand in hand together? Um, or do we really need to be cautious as citizens about thinking, you know, when we think about things like contract tracing and, you know, the QR codes that they're using in China to let people travel? I mean, you certainly can see the public health benefits of those things, but it seemed like I, I wouldn't expect as someone who's covered government for my entire adult life that if we give up something that we should expect to get it back in six months. <laughs> I think that's right. I also think you should never have a, a strategy, whether it's a national security strategy or a public health strategy that cuts against the grain of who you are as a political culture. And, you know, we're not Norway or Singapore. We're a country full of people who deeply distrust their own government and very often with good reason. If you look at the way um, information surreptitiously gathered by police forces was used for purposes that nobody consented to. Um, but what the... Um, what free societies are good at and what the United States in our loud disputatious way is exceptionally good at is arguing these things through and balancing rather than making a binary choice to compromise all of our civil liberties or to compromise our public health. We're going to have a big, loud discussion and there are already some really good, thoughtful entrants into it. I mean, Bobby Chesney, the University of Texas uh, law school professor, has a terrific piece up on lawfare about how to hit a balance that permits protecting the common good of public health in a time of pandemic without too large a compromise. We need to have the argument about where the trade-offs are going to be and which set of risks we prefer to run. But that's actually what we're good at. Yeah. What about just to add on to what, what Corey is saying, an important point I think about this trade off now is that if we tried to make the trade off of much more draconian controls for more public health knowledge in the past month, it would not have done any good because we had no tests. We didn't know anything. And so the South Koreans, for example, had this very elaborate contact tracing, but they were testing basically everybody in the country. I mean, they're testing a very, very large number of people. And the Chinese, of course, were doing it a different way. So it was, it's, it's an argument that if you'd been much more sort of jackbootish in the last month, it wouldn't have done any good because nobody knew who was, was sick. The other thing I just wanted to say, uh, reinforcing Corey's point, is that we do have real-time experiments going on around the country of Tennessee and Kentucky very uh, similar adjoining states that have had different statewide policies. Um, the New York versus uh, San Francisco, et cetera, et cetera. So there is this, I think we're having a real time experiment and next week, next month, at the end of this year, we'll know much more about what is what is working out. Absolutely. So 
I want to get, um, Corey, your your input on what could be the sort of long term geopolitical uh, outcomes of this, because, um, you know, as we're all sort of trying to grapple with what's happening at home, people like Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong Un are still doing what they're doing. And I'm wondering um, if you if i mean looking at china looking at russia north korea like where where is your eye towards in terms of who you think is really trying to take advantage of this and or is it too early to tell so i have been surprised that america's adversaries haven't been more aggressive in finding ways to use a moment not just of our internal focus but this is the first time in 75 years that there's been a major international crisis and the United States has not stepped forward to argue about what needed to be doing to organize other countries in support of a common objective to flow resources to the most endangered um, and to figure out a way to cooperate and advance a common good. So I think one of the enormous risks the United States is running is not that our adversaries are being so fleet footed. Quite the contrary. If you look at the way the Chinese government has tried to propagandize their success, it's largely just reminding all of us how untrustworthy information from the Chinese government is. But the United States is failing at something and uh, everyone had expected the United States to take responsibility for, and that everybody, including us, is better off when we do that. So the first big consequence is the potential, we are seeing for the first time what President Trump's America First strategy looks like. And it's a much more chaotic, much more dangerous, much more deadly, and much more costly international order. The second big consequence I think we're seeing is the strain that the European Monetary Union is under and maybe the entire project of European unification because um, you know, 67% of Italians now disapprove of the European Union uh, and everyone is waiting for Germany, who has been one of the main beneficiaries of the monetary union, to relax its concern about deficit spending and about amortizing the risk of bonds across the very different economies of the European Union. I really think either Germany steps forward to further unify Europe or the European unification effort will fragment. Uh, the third big international consequence is so far only the great powers and the wealthy states have really been hit by this. Mm -hmm. Countries that have people who travel in large numbers. But when this um, migrates to countries that don't have well-developed public health systems, this is going to be a disaster of um, even more outsized proportions than we have seen in the United States and in other countries that have well-developed public health systems. And um, we're not doing nearly enough to help prepare. And that's not just about their welfare and interest, but we can't actually prophylactically protect ourselves against this. There are going to be second and third iterations. We have a vested interest in helping raise the public health standards everywhere if we expect to be safe ourselves. I mean, James, do you feel like it's funny, you know, you think about Trump and a lot of his critics from the get go have accused him of authoritarian tendencies. I think you can make the argument that at least for part of this response, it's almost been the opposite. I mean, he's thrown his hands up and said, I, I don't I don't want to deal. Um, but I, I know and I know, Corey, you've talked about this, too. So if you want to jump in after James, but, you know, at the same time, as we have pulled back from the rest of the world, um, we're now having to 
go to them and ask for help because we don't have these systems in place in part because of, you know, the gutting of places like the CDC and other institutions in America. So like, can you talk about that? Because it seems very um, in it's sort of the opposite of what some people had worried Trump might do in a moment like this. Yes. And so I think um, I think of a distinction between personal authoritarianism and governmental effectiveness. And again, you, I mentioned Singapore before, <laughs> back in the, the era of Lee Kuan Yew, who was a very strong willed and strong armed leader. I was living, uh, I was getting in, you know, it was during the era when he was jailing people if they chewed gum and they were having lashes for people who would swear and uh, boring the Western press, et cetera. But it was high minded and effective. So there was personal authoritarianism towards, at least he argued, a sort of public good. In this case, in the current administration in the U.S., it seems to be just personal authoritarianism and as opposed to any uh, public benefit. I, I, I would, again, in sync with what Corey is saying, I'd suggest th these three different uh, timelines, which are affecting the way in which the United States and traditional leaders are able to respond. One is the striking fact that the countries that are most, all the countries you would expect to be setting some kind of example right now are themselves really wallowing in virus problems. The U.S. has its obvious crises. China was the source of this originally. The U.K. is in terrible shape with the virus. Germany and France are struggling as well, almost as much as Italy. Uh, Sweden, in its sort of moral arbiter role, has, has its own problems. Really, the only political states who could say, look, listen to us because we did this right, are the ones we've mentioned, South Korea and Taiwan. South Korea is a small place, not accustomed to a big uh, presence outside pop culture. Taiwan has its own diplomatic situation, and, and it's uh, that 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 is is obvious and limits its ability to set an example. So, right at the moment, you have the traditional usual suspects uh, are sort of are struggling with their own problems. There is the medium term. Let's say the rest of this year, through the spring and summer and the fall, where as Corey has written uh, uh, recently in The Atlantic, and as we've all discussed, the U.S. has been dissing its normal allies and in the international institutions for the last three or four years, and now calling on them for help. And they're likely to say, well, you know, what have you done for us lately? Why should we, why should we be helping you when you've been just kind of uh, uh, trotting all over us? Then there's the time after this fall's election. And I think that there is the, in my view, lastingly different view from the rest of the world, depending on the way this fall's election goes, of whether the U.S. ratifies the America first policy or changes the America first policy. But I think there, to me, there, there are different tranches. Right now, there's an emergency where nobody's really in a good position to say, listen to us, except the South Koreans and, and the Taiwanese. Yeah. Well, let's, let's can talk. I, oh yeah. Go ahead, Corey. Can I give an example that reinforces James very good point? Um, the United States has been in negotiations with South Korea about cost sharing for a bit of the deployment for the 35,000 or so American troops that are stationed in South Korea. And on the just about the very day President Trump wrote the president of South Korea asking for them to uh, ship us medical equipment because President Trump was also demanding a five-fold increase in what South Korea pays the United States for basing troops there. We were turning away the South Koreans who work on American military bases making them less militarily capable and making us really crummy allies at the same time we were asking the South Koreans to give us life-saving help. So it's just one more example. If I can make one other point in answer to your question, it has been a real surprise to me. I like the distinction James made between personal authoritarianism and government uh, the ability to work the machinery of government. And it has been genuinely astonishing to me that President Trump and the president's men who have been so ruthlessly inventive in finding ways to get around the norms and even in some instances like uh, diverting spending to the wall, constitutional red lines 
of presidential behavior. This administration has brought none of that kind of force majeure or creativity to using uh, an imperial presidency to protect the lives of Americans. And I just, I just don't get it. Well, <laughs> I guess we could, we, we could all make some <laughs> uh, statements about that, but I think, um, I just want to note that as we have been talking here, I just saw that uh, the president has announced that he is suspending all aid or all funding to the World Health Organization. Um, that, that, that'll, um, I, I, I bit my tongue before responding. So let, let us, uh, shall, shall I make a, a different point, a more high road point? <laughs> so uh, Corey was talking about, um, again, the way in which an administration, well, I'll, I'll, I'll circle, circle back around, through, to my mind, the most important essay in American political history is one that came out 110 years ago. And I probably mentioned I was at the Commonwealth Club a couple of years ago with my wife. This is it's called The Moral Equivalent of War by the philosopher William James. And his argument was looking back on the Civil War it was the most horrible episode in American history with still more lives lost than the other uh, conflict the U.S. has been or all the rest of our wars combined. And yet, William James said, the, the personal courage, the sense of the greater good, the political leadership and Abraham Lincoln and his associates, the better parts of human character and the American um, ideals were, were also evoked by the worst event in our history. So William James said the permanent struggle for a society like the United States was to find a moral equivalent of war, of a way to enlist these better parts of, of individual and collective behavior without having the actual war. Yeah. And through US, the history of the US since that time, it's often been, you know, military challenges themselves where people have been able to say, uh, yes, we'll all, all pull together. Or I would argue also often it's been public health challenges. When I was a little kid, it was actually the time of the polio vaccine. There was a sense of you had to stay home and not go swimming in the summer because you had to endure these limits on your, your own personal freedom for the greater good. And there have been other times where public health has been a kind of moral equivalent of war. And maybe that is something we'll see here too. The, 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 again, the economic uh, just devastation that's happening now, the constraints on all of us, if we think there is some greater good we are serving, that is the part of the American tradition that it connects to. And um, this thing on the World Health Organization will not help that <laughs> occur in my view. I also wanna take a practical stick to hit this bad decision on the president's part. What an America engaged internationally gets us and what international institutions that are our early warning network out in the world, what that gets us is strategic depth. It gives us the ability to understand problems before Americans start dying from them. And the Centers for Disease Control used to, up until a year ago, uh, fund the position for an American doctor inside the Chinese governmental health network. And that was an extraordinarily good use of American tax dollars because that person knew what was happening no matter what the Chinese communist government said. They had the kinds of relationships where people shared information. They had the direct connection back to the CDC so that you could sound an alarm early for the United States. That's what organizations like the World Health Organization and an activist international America get us. What the president has done with his America First national security strategy is back up away from those institutions to stop staffing them, to stop funding them. They don't stop occurring just because we stop paying for it. The Chinese and others move into leadership roles. So these organizations will be less help to us, will be more useful to our adversaries because of this kind of self-defeating policy on the president's part. Well, and of course, you know, 
both of you, it's not just in on the world stage, right? We have seen this administration, I think you could argue really shirk its duties as a federal government, um, telling, you know, governors that it was up to them to find their own test and their own pr protective gear for nurses and doctors. But in a way, James, you know, going back to this idea that I know you've written about, which is the brokenness of our federal system and the trust that people then it's engendered in some ways in their local and state governments. It, isn't that an argument or isn't this current situation an argument for our sort of devolved federalist system? Like, I mean, couldn't you see this as a good thing in a way? Because we have seen leadership and it's not just from Democrats. I mean, look at Mike DeWine in Ohio and, and how far he's taken things prior to the president sort of giving permission. Um, yes. Um, yes. And I was going to say yes, but I'll say, say <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yes. And so it is striking that um that Mike DeWine, Republican of Ohio, may have been, uh, along with Gavin Newsom, obviously Democrat of California, there was sort of the two governors who were most aggressive early on. Charlie Baker of Massachusetts, a Republican, has uh, matched you know, J.B. Prisker in Illinois and Jay Inslee in Washington State, Democrats, obviously. So one of the points that Deb and I made um, or struck by so much in our travels is, especially at the mayor's level and generally at the governor's level, you don't really know. I mean, obviously, political alignment matters, but the poison of national politics, generally, governors and mayors can't afford to indulge in that because they have to run a state. They have to run, run a community. So I guess I would say to answer your question more directly, yes, of course, one of the central axes of American life is the balance between the national and the local or the, the state, and that's that balance will continue. Number two, in the current disastrous failure of federal leadership, it is wonderful that so many governors, not all of them, but so many and so many mayors and so many regional officials are behaving so well. I'll give an exception to the rule. We spent a lot of time reporting in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. The mayor of Sioux Falls, well, of course, there's been a big outbreak and a big meatpacking plant just in the last couple of days, a plant where we spent a lot of time ourselves. The mayor of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Paul Tenhaken, is a very conservative Republican. He is behaving like other mayors right now, saying we have to have some public safety. Uh, the governor of South Dakota, Christy Nome, is one of the few governors who's saying, no, not our problem. So the tension is between a responsible mayor and one of the few governors who is not acting. So my point, too, was we're fortunate to have governors and mayors who are responding to the challenge. Point three is there's some things it would be better if the federal government did. <laughs> the federal government it can, is the only one that can set sort of, um, it controls the port. It can allocate strategic equipment among the states. So yes, this is a balanced country. Yes, it's really a blessing that so many governors and mayors are responding as they are and so many citizens. But number three, it would be bet there's jobs for the federal government. And the federal government should start doing them. Corey, I mean, it seemed like at the beginning of this in early March, the president was most focused on the economy and the sort of potential implications of a shutdown on that. Um, he has pivoted this week, uh, yesterday, asserted total authority over whether states reopen and how they reopen. Um, a, a, one question from a, an audience member named Robert, he asks if we're overly dependent on political and social and institutional norms and leader relationships for ensuring that the federal to state response to pandemics is timely and effective. Um, which, which also brings me to something else yeah. that I've just noticed watching this, which is like the deference we've seen from a lot of uh, governors like, like Gavin Newsom to the, you know, the president, they don't want to anger him. They don't want to criticize him. I, I mean, how are you thinking about that? And like, what is the right way <laughs> in your mind for us to be, I don't know, I mean, maybe even thinking past this of like how to ensure this doesn't happen again. So I agree with the questioner, Robert, that uh, I have been surprised at how much of what I believed were constitutional or statutory constraints on executive power are actually normative. Mm -hmm. uh, Susan Hennessy and Ben Wittes, uh, two of the, of the anchors of the Lawfare blog, have a terrific book just out uh, that explores all of the areas in which uh, 
they were surprised that the president has latitude of action. Uh, so I, I share Robert's worry and it's coming into sharp relief because the president can't resist the temptation to, to act like a grifter in this circumstance, to sort of say the people who support me are the people I'm gonna give federal assistance to. And that's morally wrong. It also strikes me as bad politics in a presidential election year. And the ultimate repository of our safety, as Thomas Jefferson uh, tells us all, is ultimately the American people. Uh, if, if our fellow Americans are gonna say that's okay, then we become a very different kind of country than a country that expects its chief executive to be nonpartisan in a national crisis and to step forward and console the nation and have a plan and um, empower positive action. And that's actually not what we are seeing President Trump do. And it's not only a great sorrow, it's also having real world effects on people's lives and on the economy. We are paying a much higher price in economic damage and in human sacrifice for the president's failures. I mean, what are your thoughts on whether that the what the political implications are going to be for that i mean it feels like we live in a sort of even before this groundhog day where the numbers go up and down a little bit but the president's base has largely stayed with him and i i just wonder if if we're in a situation like 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 does anything give i guess is my question i don't think i have any greater insight than any other american taxpayer on that subject James, you have any thoughts? So to talk um, electoral politics for a second, yeah. to, to the extent any of the laws of physics of American history apply to our current time, uh, you would observe two things. One is um, in every elect presidential election since the Civil War, where it's a two-candidate a two, two election, the losing candidate has always gotten at least 40%. Herbert Hoover got 40% against FDR in 1932. Barry Goldwater got almost 30, almost 40% against Lyndon Johnson in 1964. There is a, the fact that 35 or 40% of the public is reliably with you does not necessarily mean you're going to win. That's just one, one uh, factor. The, the other just a uh, law of physics is that Every president in the history of polling has at some point been above the mid 60s in his, his approval rating. I worked for Jimmy Carter long ago. His uh, high approval rating was, I think, 69 or 70 percent. Barack Obama was in the low 70s. Each of the George Bushes was above 90 at some point because of their, their wartime efforts. Bill Clinton was in the 70s. Um, Donald Trump has never reached even 50 percent in the in the approval rating. And so by the laws of physics, this is not, by of past physics, this is not a strong hand to be holding going into a re-election race. Because things were so surprising last time, we're hesitant to apply the law, laws of physics to the next time. But but that is uh, the other point. Just to, to add one thing briefly to what Corey is saying before, theoretically, or in the way a government is supposed to run, a president in times of crisis represents the interest of the public and state governors represent the interest of their people, regardless of their political affiliation, you can see some governors who you know do not agree with Donald Trump. Governor Cuomo in New York, Governor Newsom in California, Governor Inslee in Washington, they don't agree with him on practically anything, but they recognize the interests of their state require them to cooperate with the uh, with the powers that be in Washington. So they are behaving the way leaders are supposed to behave. Uh, the insistence right now that people sort of um, propitiate themselves, propitiate Trump, that, 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 is, that is abnormal. And we won't even talk about the, uh, the briefings unless you bring them up. <laughs> well, I was going to actually. <laughs> um, you know, 
I don't know if you guys caught yesterday's briefing, but he played what was actually a pretty low budget, surprisingly, <laughs> almost propaganda video. I mean, it seemed like something you might play at a campaign rally um, over a press briefing. Corey, I I'm just curious, like, do you think Americans should at this point almost be tuning out those briefings because the, you know, the headlines were getting elsewhere, but I mean, what's your sort of take, like approach to all of this? How are you thinking about how to um, sort of cull your own exposure to the media, which is really overwhelming right now, I think, regardless of whether, where you sit politically? So um, I, I do think people should watch the briefings so that they can judge whether the president's comportment is providing information that the public needs for safety and prosperity, whether they are comfortable with the president's behavior in the crisis, whether uh, he is improving public safety. Um, so um, I personally, uh, am shocked that the president is so violating the norm of expected presidential behavior and so politicizing and using for personal aggrandizement um, what it seems to me would be better used for public information, for helping people to understand the nature of the problem, for helping us understand how to make this okay eventually. Um, and I think the fact that the president's not doing that is something that should weigh heavily in all of our judgments about as we choose our political leaders. Do you think, kind of back to that question I asked earlier about the, the, the silver lining of federalism, so to speak, do you foresee that there could be any sort of long-term shifts in terms of the power structure between states and the federal government um, because of this? I mean, we we talk a lot about the norms that, that Trump may have violated and what that could mean longer term for our political system, but it strikes me that this could pretend a shift as well. You want, Corey, you want to take that first? You know, that's a really interesting challenge, Marisa. Um, I'm skeptical that it will result in a major reshuffling of the authorities or responsibilities between states and the federal government. But I do think it will have long-term consequences in reminding us that governors have to be good chief executives in a way very many national politicians don't have to. Running a Senate staff isn't necessarily the best preparation for running the federal government, but running a state of, you know, the magnitude of California or Washington State or Ohio, um, where you have to balance your budget every year and also provide health care. Um, I think we're... we're Again, I'm one taxpayer's view, but it does seem to me likely that it's going to remind us why historically so many governors have been effective presidents. Yeah. James, you mentioned before, you know, we were talking about Trump's approval ratings, um, and I want to kind of shift our discussion to looking forward to November, because obviously a cornerstone of our democracy is a free and fair election. Um, I want to start with Wisconsin, because what happened there, you know, I think um, even in this extraordinary time did sort of rise above the noise. Um, can you just tell me your thoughts on how things played out there and, 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 what concerns you have? I mean, Wisconsin is such an important state for, you know, the question of who becomes the next president. Um, yes, indeed. And and I'll preface that just with br briefly following on something Corey was saying about the right. governor versus senator distinction. It really is the case that that governors looking sort of with raised eyebrows about senators always say senators just have to give speeches and, you know, take positions and governors have to actually manage and they have to balance budgets, they have to do all these things. And, and I think, interestingly, one more model for thinking about Donald Trump in office is essentially he's viewed the presidency as a Senate seat. He's 
taking speeches, holding rallies, and kind of uh, uh, you know taking positions as opposed to actually managing things, which is the first we've had pre you know a few senators in office before, but you know, they have had to the previous ones have had to grasp the the mechanics of of government. The Wisconsin situation is, which I've only been obviously seeing from a distance since I haven't been traveling any place in the last while, is I, I think it has been the outcome is significant that the the to have this very resounding victory for the Democratic candidate for the the Supreme Court there in the face of what looked like uh, of the latest instance of one of the other long-term axes in American history, which is, the right to vote has been much, it's not just a, an issue that's been in the news for the last four or five years. Any part of American history, whether it's women getting the right to vote or whether it's you know Jim Crow after, after the Civil War, the right to vote has always been contested. And whatever party uh, thinks it, it is threatened by expanding the franchise has tried to, uh, to limit it. And I think the struggle, this um, it's worth taking very seriously both the mechanics of voting this fall now, what six, seven, six and a half months from now, a mail ballot seemed to be indispensable just because of of, of the uh, the conditions and registration, all the other things which are mechanically necessary. I think the fact that so that the unusual conditions of the virus it's focusing people's attention now early, and second, the fact that Democrats have agreed on a nominee in a historically early in the cycle. It means they're not going to spend the next two or three months fighting among themselves, but again, again, can try to start looking on these turnout and franchise issues, which I think will be very, very important within Wisconsin and elsewhere. Corey, you were nodding when he talked about all mail ballots. This has really become a struggle between the parties. We heard the president say recently that if it's an all mail election, Republicans would lose. Um, Representative Kevin McCarthy, minority leader, accused Speaker Pelosi of I think he called it disgusting politics to try to put money into, um, a, you know, a bill at this time to push broader vote by mail. I'm curious as a conservative, like where, what you think about that, because I have found it really interesting to see this flipped being in California my whole life, you know, historically who voted by mail was more rural, more conservative, yeah. wealthier, generally wider <laughs> voters. Like that was who, so I, I, I just, Broadly, what do you think about vote by mail as a system? And then we could talk about what you think maybe should happen this year. As a conservative, I believe everybody, every American citizen of voting age should have the ability to vote and should exercise that franchise. Because if you don't, you are voting for whoever wins. Right. Um, and second of all, um, because of concerns about the ability of foreign intelligence agents to be able to reach into electronic voting systems. I think for reasons that don't even have anything to do with domestic American politics, we ought to have a manual backup and vote by mail provides one really good way to have a manual backup to every other system. So I think we ought to have lots of ways of ensuring electoral security and vote by mail provides one of them. I haven't ever seen any evidence of significant voter fraud as a result of vote by mail. And for people who um, are mobility challenged or in this crazy dangerous time immunocompromised, the ability to vote without leaving their homes uh, is an important um, fairness issue, I think. Why do you think this has become such a touchstone, particularly, you know, in conservative circles that, that, that there's this just automatic connection that vote by mail equals fraud, given everything you just spoke about, Corey, but also what I said, which is like, who's taken advantage of it historically has been more conservative voters, at least in my home state. I think any effort to restrict voting always comes from a place of insecurity that you're not going to be able to win the argument. Yeah. Um, what do you guys think should be happening now? Because James, as you just noted, I mean, the election feels sort of far away, but it's not. And when I talk to registrars and secretaries of state, 
they say, you know, if we're going to make an investment, it does need to happen now. Um, you want know, James, maybe you start and then Corey, like what should Congress be doing right now? So, so again, as continuing the theme of the paralysis of federal level government, we know that the House would likely pass any bill it could to support um, state uh, secretaries of state and voting systems. But we know that because um, Mitch McConnell has blocked so many such efforts over the last year, year or two, that it's not likely to come fr from the federal government. I think that the main, I think it will therefore be a 50 state and a few territories case-by-case case effort, which I mentioned earlier, the Democrats are historically early in settling on a nominee. That will let them, I think, direct some of their attentions to that. I agree entirely with Corey that the reason for the uh, all of the emotion against a sort of statistically unprovable threat of vote-by-mail fraud is a, a sense of existential demographic um, being on the wrong, wrong side of history from the, the National Republican Party. You recall that after Mitt Romney lost, all of the studies on the Republican Party were, uh, if we don't attract younger people, uh, non-white people, people of a wide variety of backgrounds, we are doomed historically. And I think that, that the low road way to address that challenge is to find ways to suppress turnout. So I think it's going to be a state by state effort over the next few months. It should begin now. Corey, what are your thoughts? I mean, I, I think we can all agree that it seems unlikely that Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi are going to, you know, sing kumbaya and come to an agreement on this. But I mean, you know, back to the federalist system, it's like that is both one of our strengths and weaknesses that you will have such disparities in people's access and ability to get either to the polls or virtually there. So I'm not an expert on voting systems, so I'm not sure I can actually offer any useful advice on what we should do. I, I would have one comment though on James's very good point about the studies that Republicans did after Mitt Romney's loss. Um, and what I notice as a college professor, in my time as a college professor, and what I notice in, in the young people of my acquaintance now is not that they aren't winnable to con conservative principles. They think we aren't honoring them. Right? <laughs> and so uh, we actually have to square our shoulders and do the right principled conservative things and that's how you attract diverse voters. That's how you attract young voters. That's how you have everybody vote. Because there's just no substitute for winning the argument. And I personally believe there's enormous appeal in conservative principles. But we actually have to live our principles if we expect other people to sign up for them with us. And I'll say, I wish that Corey were one of the 53 members of the Republican Senate majority right now, because the only person I've heard make that case in public among that group is Mitt Romney mm -hmm. when describing the reason for his vote on, on the, the impeachment. Uh, and for some reason, people who like to think of themselves as conservatives in the GOP Senate majority are not saying what Corey just uh, so well said, in my view. What um, concerns, I mean, or, or do you have concerns that what happened in Wisconsin and, and then there's this sort of broader debate that sort of roiled our country in recent years over things like expanding or suppressing the vote will have on turnout? I mean, there's obviously just the straight up question of this virus and whether people feel safe to vote. Um, and then I think there's sort of the psychological impacts even beyond that. So is that a concern right now, I guess, is the question. So if I, I can jump in here, I think that is a concern and has always been. And in each election, you know, I've, I've been around for a, a lot of them now and, and, and worked, as I said, on a, a camp presidential campaign lo long ago. It's always a question of which group will be able to turn out its people and how the pe those who are in charge of the electoral, electoral machinery are trying to, to suppress that. I think that the uh, the Democrats will probably face, on the one hand, more practical obstacles in terms of, you know, you need to have vote by mail, all the other, uh, some of the, the rules that have been changed in many states. But there is, in my observation, a more concerted democratic uh, 
enthusiasm now, even if it's a negative enthusiasm, uh, to turn out that this this fall. There was a positive enthusiasm for a lot of Democrats when Bar Barack Obama was running, especially the first time. There was less enthusiasm this past time. And I think there'll be more perhaps negative, perhaps positive enthusiasm. So I think that the, de the Democrat, that will be the balance between the emotion behind turnout and the obstacles turnout might face. Yeah. Corey, what about the question, like here in California, you know, we like to have like a 200 page ballot with about 65 initiatives, everything from like marijuana to like if my cat can get neutered. I mean, seriously, though, like, and, and that may not be the case this year. And something like I've given thought to in recent years um, is the sort of opposite of of. Um, of coattails, you know, this idea that sometimes it's local issues or local candidates that bring people to the polls if they're really turned off by national politics. So if we don't have, you know, if people don't have the ability to say place initiatives on ballots around the nation because they can't gather signatures or, you know, it's it's a challenge in any time to get attention if you're not an incumbent. Um, how do you do that if you can't fundraise or leave the house? Like, do you have any concerns about that that effect on this election? It's not so much that I have concerns as that I am excited to see what creativity is going to be driven by the need to innovate in these ways. Um, because you're right. I mean, how do you conduct a campaign in this context? But the very best article ever written about American foreign policy was written by James Fallows. And it was in the Atlantic in 2009 when he came back from having been posted in Beijing. And I can't remember the name of the article, but the subject was uh, looking at uh, America through the eyes of someone who had lived in China and realizing that we were beginning to get so fearful about the rise of China that we were we had averted our eyes from what we're actually good at. And I love so much, he uses a metaphor of the Jeremiah, right? The role of the, of the Jeremiah in American foreign policy. And I think it's applicable to this, which is that when we realize we have a problem, we're falling behind Japan in the 1970s or China's not gonna become a responsible stakeholder or, how in the world are we going to carry out a national election with all of these uh, weird new... What Americans are really good at is feeling like we're screwing stuff up and creatively building a better mousetrap. And, and that's the, the way to bet your money on the United States. We almost never have it right but we mess around and get it right. And I feel like we're gonna just see a huge flowering of that as all of the people who are trying to get elected start experimenting with how can I reach voters and be meaningful to them if I can't actually meet them. I love, I love your optimism and we only have about four minutes left. So I want to stay with that because I think one thing we all need right now is hope, right? I mean, we need to know that, um, you know, I think we all go back and forth on the one hand, it's like, this is awful and we're all stuck at home and the economy is crashing and who knows what's going to happen. Um, on the other hand, we're just being asked to stay at home, which seems like, you know, given the sacrifices Americans have historically been asked to make not that big of one. Um, so. I know that it's, we're still in this crisis and there are people losing family members every day and it's scary and it's a lot. But I want to start first with you, James. Is there anything that you are specifically hopeful that will come out of this, whether it be a policy or a change in how we think about governance? Um, and then I'll go to you, Corey. Yes, I'll start and say with thanks to Corey for her gracious reference. I also cannot remember the title of that article. And the reason is until the last minute, the title was, is America going to hell? And then there was some <laughs> failure of nerve on the editor's part, and they changed it to something else. <laughs> so I always thought of it as the America going to hell article in, in 2009. But what, what I'm, I'm optimistic about 
in these very, very challenging times with the highest unemployment, what will be highest unemployment of my lifetime, which is, you know, very long, which is we're, we're about to face, is connected to what, what Corey was saying, which is that there, we're having an enforced, unexpected experimentation in 50 states and a thousand cities and millions of households. And from that, I hope that muscle memory of a different way of coping is being developed, of ways in which um, you know uh, states can work together. You know, they've always talked about the concept of regionalism, but now they actually have to do it. In which um, communities have a different sense of where actual how people are actually their fates are actually tied together, and that the the physical places that people share have importance, and who is really at need that we weren't weren't aware of, and so it is possible that some of these moral equivalent of war experimentations of in a dark time, we may discover ways, resources in ourselves, resources in our neighbors, resources in our institutions we didn't know were there. Not, you know, th th that is what may come of a really dark period. And that's, that's, that would be my hope. Corey, how about you? I mean, you talked about it a little bit, but. So the great Nigerian novelist Chinua Achebe wrote that uh, wealth prosperity puts a layer, a thick layer of adipose tissue over our sensibilities. <laughs> and one of the really beautiful things about this national crisis is that those of us who are prosperous, who live frictionless existences uh, upholstered by privilege and by wealth are being reminded how much all of that depends on people who have to take a bus to their grocery store shelf stocking. Um, and I, I am really inspired to see all of the ways that civil society, that the civic virtues of Americans are being activated to see each other again, which is of course the start of empathy. And I hope that that will be sustained for us because it will be our salvation if it does. All right, we are going to leave it there. Um, thank you, James Fallows and Corey Shockey. This was a fabulous conversation and really appreciate your insights. Thank you for thank your you, great moderation, Marisa. I also want to thank Betsy and Roy Eisenhart and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and our other supporters for making this virtual event and others possible. If you want to see more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making these virtual programming specials, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Marisa Lagos from KQED. Thank you and stay safe, everyone.